Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation, which accompanies the review article, Bold in Practice, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Treatment and Management in the Primary Care Study. I'm Dr. Barbara Yawn, a family physician, researcher, and chief scientific officer of the COPD Foundation. On behalf of my co-authors, Dr. Matthew Mintz and Dr. Dennis Doherty, I would like to walk you through a patient's office visit viewed from the clinician's perspective. Ben is a 58-year-old man who is here for what he's calling bronchitis. Ben has productive cough, particularly in the morning. He experiences shortness of breath while climbing stairs or mowing the lawn. He notes that this isn't his first bronchitis. He thought it would be better after stopping smoking four years ago. When I listened to Ben's heart and lungs, his breath sounds were diminished. I heard mild crackling on expiration by auscultation, which cleared when I asked him to cough. Ben might just have an upper respiratory tract infection, but because he has had repeated episodes, I wonder if it isn't something else like asthma, viral pneumonia, COPD, or cardiovascular disease. However, he did not present with audible wheezing or describe a typical asthma attack. He was never told he had asthma during childhood, suggesting that it's probably not asthma. His pulse and blood pressure were fine, and his heart sound is good. I didn't hear any row. He does not have chest pain with exertion or dyspnea at rest or when lying down. So I don't think he has congestive heart failure either. He could still have cardiovascular disease, given that he has some risk factors. But his blood pressure is fine. His cholesterol is only a little mildly elevated. He's not obese, and he does not have diabetes. He also has no fever or other signs of infection. And this seems likely a chronic problem. So it's not likely pneumonia. Overall, his symptoms are consistent with COPD. I ordered a chest x-ray to rule out other diagnoses. As anticipated, Ben's chest x-ray showed no infiltrate, his heart was not enlarged, and there was no fluid present. I suspect he had COPD, but to confirm this diagnosis, he needs pre- and post-bronchodilator spirometry assessment. The Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or GOLD, provides a strategy document for the diagnosis, management, and prevention of COPD. Per GOLD, a post-bronchodilator FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 0.7 is confirmatory for COPD. We can use the FEV1% predictive value to classify Ben's COPD into one of four categories, grade one or mild, grade two or moderate, grade three or severe, or grade four, very severe airflow limitation. Strong two results showed a post-bronchodilator FEV1 over FVC ratio of 0.66 which indicated that Ben was only able to empty 66% of his total exhalation or forced vital capacity in the first second. Ben's airflow limitation may be why he feels breathless on exertion. He also likely has air trapping and dynamic hyperinflation, meaning he does not empty his lungs, retaining more air with exercise and increased respiratory rate. Based on his FEV1% predicted of 64%, Ben has moderate or gold grade 2 airflow limitation. The next step is to select an initial medication based on symptom burden and history of exacerbation. We can assess symptom burden using tools such as the MMRC and or the COPD assessment test called the CAS. The MMRC, or Modified British Medical Research Council Dyspnea Scale, is used to assess a patient's level of dyspnea. It's self-administered, and it's a questionnaire that includes five grades. An MMRC grade of two or higher indicates poor health. 
expands MMRC is two. He walks more slowly than others his age and sometimes stops because he's short of breath. The cat is an eight item questionnaire and scores for each item range from zero to five. A cat score of 10 or higher indicates poor health. The MMRC and CAT questionnaires are relatively short and simple and can be self-administered by the patient in just a few minutes, often before you even see them at a follow-up visit. Exacerbation history may be more difficult to capture, especially for someone who's not yet been diagnosed with COPD, so will not report COPD exacerbation. You'll need to ask more questions or look into his chart for instances of bronchitis, bad colds, or trips to the emergency department for respiratory illnesses, which may have actually been COPD exacerbation. The GOLD ABCD classification tool helps us to select appropriate initial pharmacologic treatment. The left-hand column is low symptoms and the right side is high symptom burden. The bottom row is fewer or no exacerbations, while the upper row is two or more exacerbations or a COPD hospitalization. This means that group A have low symptom burden and fewer no exacerbations, while group B have high symptom burden and two or more exacerbations or a COPD hospitalization in the past year. Given that Ben had an MMRC grade of 2, a CAT score of 12, fewer than two exacerbations per year, and no hospitalizations for his COPD, he belongs in gold group B, high symptom burden, but few exacerbations. Long-acting bronchodilators are recommended as initial pharmacotherapy for COPD across all patient groups. A LABA or a LAMA is recommended as initial pharmacotherapy for group B patients. And according to the GOAL committee, LAMAs have greater effect on COPD exacerbation reduction than LABAs based on evidence level A support. So I prescribed a LAMA for Ben. If he'd been more symptomatic, I would have considered starting with combined LABA and LAMA inhaled therapy. We need to consider the different types of inhalers that are available to deliver the medication. Dry powder inhalers, pressurized meter dose inhalers, and soft mist inhalers. After a new medication has been prescribed, it's good practice to follow up in three or four weeks. I also ask the patient to call back after getting their medication from the pharmacy to make sure they know how to use the inhaler they received in case the pharmacist has had to change inhaler devices or brands due to insurance coverage. I regularly monitor symptoms using the CAT and review the patient's inhaler technique as well as any non-pharmacologic treatments at subsequent visits to ensure no adjustments are needed. In viewing this presentation, I hope you've learned a little bit more about how to evaluate and what to consider in a patient with respiratory symptoms suggestive of COPD.